There was a group here at McMurda that uh, just got back today. They uh, had a remote control sub that they put down through the ice of the Ross ice shelf. Went down maybe thousands of feet, at least hundreds of feet, uh, through the Ross ice shelf down into a lake that was uh, below the ice. And they collected some sediments there and brought it back up to the surface and uh, gave that to Dr. Adams today. That'll kind of tell you what kind of prestige he has where these uh, scientists, some of the top scientists from around the world would deliver some of these possessions, some of these uh, samples uh, to him. Probably comparable to bringing samples in from outer space somewhere. They're so difficult to get. We're about to go in. Dr. Adams will show you how he uh, processes these samples and uh, all the way through from just muddy water uh, onto the microscope looking to see if he could find anything living down under all this ice. So we'll go let you see that process. Uh, these samples were collected from the bottom of Lake Mercer, which is underneath the Ross ice shelf. So these scientists, some friends of mine, created a hot water drill that could drill down through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet of, of solid ice. And then once it penetrates that, then they have a tool that can, using sterile techniques, take samples from the lake that's underneath the Ross ice shelf, uh, underneath glacial ice. And so this, these are subglacial lake samples. And so this will be the first time that subglacial Lake Mercer has uh, been sampled. Now these, these are sediments that have come off the bottom of subglacial Lake Mercer, and Lake Mercer has not been exposed to the atmosphere, according to some models, 10,000 years. Other models, it's over 4 million years that it's, that it's been like a normal lake. It, the Ross Ice Shelf came and covered it up, and it's been that way for a long time. Right now, as I'm preparing this hood, so it's completely sterile, so I'm working with some samples that I want to make sure are not contaminated by something else that's here in the lab. So we've got here is some bleach, and uh, bleach is really harsh on things like DNA and, and living organisms. So I've already washed this a couple times. Let me just show you again how I do it, where I just put down a nice layer of bleach, and then I wipe it up. And the idea here is that anything that's alive on the surface of this is going to be destroyed. Now the other thing you need to understand about this tool is that it takes air and it filters it through a filter and it blows completely clean air in this direction. So that anything that I'm working with in this hood should be sterile because only clean air is blowing across it. There's no dirty air that can come into this hood, into this airspace here. Now, that UV light is going to cook whatever's in there. It's going to zap anything that's in there. So it's just like another step that we can take to make sure that that hood is completely clean. Um, I like to do the bleach first because it tends to bust them up more mm. and then the alcohol just kind of sterilizes stuff by drying it out real fast. I'm just saying the cool prediction here is going to be that the nematodes that we find, the animals that we find in these subglacial sediments, aren't going to be anything like the animals that we normally work with in this lab. I'm going to take these tubes, I'm going to clean them in bleach and ethanol as well. They've already been washed and scrubbed with soap and water. Now, we're just doing this to go the extra step. They were brought up in the ocean at one degree or so, would you say? It was actually minus like 0 0.8 minus degrees. 0 .8. So in a marine environment, it's not freezing at that temperature, but it's no. very cold. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some water in this tube, and I'm going to try and resuspend the animals that are right now all stuck in that pellet of sediment, which is a lot of goo. You imagine like goo on the bottom of the ocean? Well, this is sort of like goo on the bottom of a, of a lake or the ocean. You'll see that stuff on the edge there that's... 
it's not going in the solution. And it could have dried out a little bit, you know, after they took the sample, you know, they put it in the tube and dried out a little. I'm not too worried about it. So the bulk of the sam sample is still down here. You can see it in those, that pellet there. Back in the so the cool thing is we just added water to that sample and as you can see it's not going into solution. It's kind of cool. This stuff is like, uh, like you'd imagine like what concrete is like. It's a, uh, it's really clay kind of texture, silky, sticky stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and get it into solution because remember the animals are in that goo somewhere. So I'm going to try and liberate them. So I tried some gentle rocking and that's really not doing it. So what I've got here is a sterile um, spatula. I'm gonna use that to mix, mix, mix things up in there. So now I'm gonna split this sample in half. See, I've kind of got it into solution a little bit, but it's not great. But in order to balance the centrifuge out, I'm gonna split this in half. So I'm gonna put half of this into that tube there. So on this step, we're going to put them in the centrifuge, we're going to spin them, and all the animals that are floating around in there should get spun down to the bottom of this. So you should have water on top and animals and a bunch of goo in the bottom. That's what we're predicting this is going to look like when we're done. Set that in there like this. Make sure the cap's on good. And shake it up just a little bit. Get those animals suspended as best we can. Gonna run this for you know four or five minutes. That's interesting there. Get a shot of that, you can see that there's some kind of a precipitate there. Well, something in solution here. You can see how it's the sediment's separated. There's a very clear pellet down here, a bunch of watery stuff here, and then it's almost like oil or something the top of that. That's mm -hmm. separated out. It's kind of cool. What we're going to do is we're going to pour this water off because now all the animals should be down there in that pellet. So I'm going to pour this off but I want to save it just in case there's some animals in here that I somehow miss. This is a very careful procedure. So we got something similar with that one too. Very interesting. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna put some sugar in here and sugar is changes the density of the liquid medium so the animals that are down here in the sugar solution when we spin it all the rocks and gunk should come to the bottom but the animals should float to the top and that's how we're going to separate the animals from the gunk that's in the sediment there Trying to get the animals that were down in that pellet resuspended so that they're floating around in the sugar solution. I'm just going to pour them over that seal.
So if we want to, we could go back and we could see if there's anything down in that pellet. That would be really weird because most animals aren't as heavy as rocks. So this right here, that's the golden sample. These are the two golden samples here. But we even like rinsed out the, the bottles that, 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 we, that we had processed them in and saved that material too, just in case. So everything that we started out with, we still have all the, just about all the original contents of everything. Now I just need to see if there's some cool animals in there. So Dr. Adams, what's the uh, what's the conclusion? What do you what do you think's going on here? So what I think is going on here is that the sediments of Lake Mercer uh, look a lot like the dry soils of the dry valleys where we used to have lakes that look like Lake Mercer now. So the lakes in the dry valleys now are ice free, but at one time, you know, the East Antarctic Ice Sheet or the West Antarctic Ice Sheet came and blocked up the ends of these valleys and you had these real big giant lakes that were there. And they were very productive. You had algal mats, you had, you know, crustaceans, um, things like that that were living in them. And, you know, the, the climate changed and these things shifted. You know, the, there was, um, the lakes dried down. And now when we sample dry soils, we find these things that used to live in things like these old paleo lakes. And so when I look through the samples uh, from the sediment from the bottom of Lake Mercer, I see a lot of, you know, broken up, reworked, ground up crustacean parts, arthropod parts, um, plant parts, not plants, but like algae, filamentous, cyanobacteria. I see things like that, that they're not alive today, but they were alive not that long ago. And they've been pretty well preserved, you know, in these really cold waters that have... Uh, uh, you know, perhaps low oxygen down there in those sediments, and so um, look really similar to what I see at the in the dry soils of the dry valleys. So, do you think there's any animals, any living animals, in that lake? Not in the sample that I collected. <laughs> yeah, there there yeah. certainly weren't any in there. Yeah. Uh, I would love it if there were, and it's possible that there were. I mean, the sample that you know I studied is was like one little blob of of gunk, you know, yeah. from the bottom of the of the lake, and so yeah. I think you know, bigger samples, wider reach. Um, I would love it to, if I could find something that was, you know, that were live, that were contemporary. But the thing is, is that you know, once you get these huge ice sheets that cover up these lakes, you know, that you just don't have light that penetrates through that. You can't get primary productivity, and so those organisms are there, the bacteria that can live there. Are feeding off the old dead carbon that was fixed you know thousands of years ago and so you know as that's it's like us burning fossil fuels in our car right eventually all those fossil fuels go away you know that we, we burn them a lot faster than they're fixed than they're made and that's what's going on in these lake systems here i think there's old carbon that's down there that these microbes can feed on they can utilize as a carbon source but at some point you know, they're going to run out of that sort of stuff. And, you know, but when you get stuff like this where it can't support, you know, metazoans, it can't support things like nematodes, tardigrades, rotifers, flatworms, things like that, that's how you know that that uh, ecosystem is running out of gas. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for letting us uh, tag along with you this afternoon. Sure. <laughs> it's fun.